Now, usually the comps are, and, and the comps would answer everything, but it's a lot of stuff in one comp. Okay? So the next question is what makes the fluid move in that way? What are some cardiac causes? What causes congestive heart failure? Okay, the valve's not working properly. Oncotic pressure? Huh? Oncotic pressure? Um, let's stick with the heart being the issue right now. So, valvular problems. Let's stick with the heart being the issue. Something cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Okay, and if you're not sure, an arrhythmia. Yeah. Systemic hypertension. Which could lead to left ventricular failure. Go ahead and turn to page. Um, Look on page 295. These are common causes of cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Something that affects the heart itself that causes the capillary pressure to rise above the oncotic pressure. Does that make sense? Yes or no? So we've got arrhythmias, we've got hypertension, We've got valvular defects, we've got infarction, and pulmonary embolism, excuse me, is one of those causes, I apologize. And um, what are, what is the other type of pulmonary edema? So what happens with non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema to make the fluid move in the way that we just stated? Increase capillary permeability. All of the things that are listed in box 23, 20-3, lead to increased capillary permeability, which includes a drop in the oncotic pressure. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. So, when this happens, how is the heart going to react? Okay, it's going to try to beat faster. It's going to have to work harder. And depending on what the problem is will depend on how much compensation will actually be able to occur. So, how is the patient going to present that is in cardiogenic or non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema? Huh? They may have Shane Stokes respirations. They may not. What are some things that are definitely going to be present? Hypoxemia. Tachycardia. Okay, now we're getting closer to these, these tachycardia, tachypnea. Um, those things can happen with a lot of different conditions. And so when we focus on how are we going to know that the patient is in pulmonary edema, they're usually going to have awakened during the night and they had to get up because they couldn't breathe while they were laying down. They have orthopnea. And so a lot of times these patients will come in during the night. And so when they get to the ER or if they're up in their room, they're going to be sitting up and they're going to be complaining of being short of breath and 
if they potentially will be coughing up some pink frothy secretions. Anything else that kind of stands out? They'll be diaphoretic, huh? So when you listen to their lungs, you'll hear fine crackles from the fluid that has moved over into the alveoli. Where are those fine crackles going to be located? In the bases. And because of the fluid squeezing or pushing in the peribronchial space, we're going to hear wheezes and anything else. Huh? Cyanosis. Cyanosis. Increased tactile and vocal fremitus. Increased tactile and vocal fremitus. And if that assessment's not done in the bases, you could quickly do a percussion and hear what kind of sound in the bases where the fluid has accumulated. Dull. Dull. Yes. Did you want to know about like your radiologic findings? Okay, so we're going to get a chest x-ray. What are we going to see on the chest x ray? Okay, what did you say? Opacities. Opacities in the bases. What did you say? Bat wing. Okay, a bat wing appearance. And typically, what will happen is you'll see it be more dense towards the center, and then it'll get fluffy and infiltrated throughout. Now this is where we can start to look and see the difference between cardiogenic versus non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Now the history is going to help us too. But with cardiogenic pulmonary edema, what are you going to see as far as the heart size? There's, there's going to be an enlarged heart or cardiomegaly. And we could also call that hypertrophy. We may not be able to identify them very easily, but there may be curly A or curly B lines. If it is cardiogenic pulmonary edema and the fluid is continuing to move out from the capillaries, where might that fluid end up going? along with it moving up the bronchio tree. The pleural space. The pleural space. So we may see a pleural effusion. Okay? So are these radiologic findings for only cardiogenic? The enlarged heart. And the pleural effusion. Although there is a possibility that there would be a pleural effusion with a non cardiogenic. So they're just supporting indications. Right. But more often, pleural effusion happens with cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Yes. Do you want us to know about the dilated pulmonary arteries that you see? Yes, I would. You know, you may have a multiple choice question that asks, you know, dilated pulmonary arteries. And yes, that is present with pulmonary edema. If the patient has a non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, will the heart be small, normal size, or large? It'll just be a normal size. X-ray uh, on Monday, I think, Monday or Tuesday. I swore this lady's heart was from shoulder to the base of the rib. Like it was huge. Wow. I, heard, I mean, she was morbidly obese probably for a long time. So I mean, she was probably twice as wide as I am. But her heart, I swear, was as big as my chest. Did she have any kind of infiltrate in the um, right upper lobe? I don't think so. It's just mm. really large heart, but huge. Wow. Okay. What else? What else with um, presentation? What are their blood gases going to look like initially? Respiratory acute respiratory alkalosis. Okay. Okay. 
Now, depending on how long the patient waited at home, they may have passed that stage and actually be in, in acute respiratory failure with hypoxemia at this point, okay? Um, no, but you will want to know while I'm at the slide right here, you will want to know about the left ventricular ejection fraction with cardiogen. No, no. <laughs> The left ventricular ejection fraction, as will pop up in a second, or five. Typically less than 40 confirms heart failure. And how is the ejection fraction determined? An echocardiograph is using ultrasound. Echocardiograph. Everybody okay with that? Well, less than 40 is um, confirms that there's some heart impairment, and I think it's. 